witchy stuff. Gabriel's POV. I wanted to throw up when I saw Macy walk into the office. She is nothing but trouble and always made me severely uncomfortable. Of course pity was taken on her when her mother died, which was stupid because no one gave a crap about Frankie when she lost her mom. But Macy just knew how to manipulate people. No. She knew how to manipulate perverted men. I could see how Adira was worried about Macy's arrival, but she didn't need to. Sure, Macy is going to get out of line and probably try to insinuate something happened between us. But Adira should trust me enough to know that didn't and would never happen. When we got back to the cabin, I knew Adira was not going to fall asleep. She thinks she can fool me, but I already know her too well. I know her heartbeat when she is sleeping, so the fact that she thought she could sneak out of bed was cute. But I let her be. Sometimes she just needed eskew moments to herself and I am not the type to suffocate her. I know she will talk to me when she is ready. I just have to make sure she knows I am here to listen. Sleep came for me, but soon I woke when I stretched my arms and still did not feel her next to me. I opened my eyes and saw that she was sitting on the window ledge. Her head leaned against the glass. I listened and I smiled. She had fallen asleep. I got up quietly and went to collect her in my arms. Once I settled her into bed, tucked under the covers, I decided I needed a little fresh air. I didn't plan on going far. Just to stretch my legs, and maybe go check on how night patrol is doing. Along the way I ran into Zeke talking to Macy. Well her, hitting on him and actually looks like she was succeeding. I shuddered. Poor guy is going to wake up full of regrets tomorrow. She saw me passing, and left him mid-sentence to come run next to me. I quickened my pace, wanting to be nowhere near her, but she caught up easily. Hey! She tried to touch my shoulder but I flinched away from her like she had a disease, which she probably did. Macy giggled and tried again. Oh, don't be like that Gabe. Don't. I stopped mid-step and looked down at her, growling. You stay the hell away from me. Stay away from me and stay away from my mate. You have no idea the consequences if you piss her off and I will not stop her when she goes to rip your throat out. Macy scoffed and rolled her eyes. How could you pick her over me? You know your uncle was just about to break your betrothal to Frankie so you and I could be together. I don't care. He could have tied to me to the posts and whipped me until I agreed to mate you and I would have died with a smile just to be clean of you. I spat in her face and her eyes turned so cold and empty. I didn't want you then. I sure as hell don't want you now. As I turned to walk away, leaving her standing there boiling in her anger, Zeke ran up beside me. He saw how pissed I was and said nothing at first. We both walked along the pack bordered and talked to the men. They were holding up fine, and so far there was nothing to report. After checking up with everyone, we headed back to the center of the pack. I'm guessing I should stay away from the crazy redhead? Zeke finally spoke up. You do whatever you want, Zeke. But I am letting you know now. Macy is not the girl that is out looking for love and family. She uses people to get what she wants and has no self-respect. Let her find out that you are Adira's best friend and I bet she will be all over you when Adira is watching just to get under her skin. Macy is petty and vindictive. Don't let her charm you because I promise it's fake. I warned him as we continued walking. I didn't mean for it to sound so harsh, but if only people knew what I knew about her, they'd see the truth too. Zeke and I wished each other a good night and went our separate ways. I don't know if he would go look for Macy, maybe just trying to be a man with needs. But I hoped he would listen to my warning and stay away from her. When I walked into the bedroom, Adira was sitting up in bed, staring out of the window. Her face was expressionless, and her eyes seemed focused. I couldn't really tell if she was aware of anything. I called out to her multiple times, 
But she didn't hear me. I crawled on the bed and shook her knee but still she did not blink. I was beginning to worry when I listened harder and her heart and breathing was as if she was still sleeping. I stood up and was about to stand in front of her when she laid down and closed her eyes like nothing happened. My instincts told me to wake her up and find out what happened, but I decided to leave it alone until morning. As I settled under the blankets next to her, she rolled over and tucked into my side. I held her body against mine and watched her for a while until finally falling asleep. I had a dream that night. More like a nightmare. I saw Macy and I together. In bed. But I felt so hazy and out of it. That wasn't the worst part. Adira was there, sitting in a chair next to the bed, crying silently as she watched. Macy moved on top of me, grinding her hips, moaning and digging in her nails in my chest. She threw her head back and smiled as she enjoyed herself. I tried to push her off, tried to scream, but I was trapped in my mind while my body was paralyzed. Gabriel. Gabriel. I heard Adira's voicing calling out to me, but her lips weren't moving. Gabriel. I felt a sharp slap against my face and I opened my eyes to see that I was back in my room, Adira hovering over me concerned. Hey. It's okay. It was just a bad dream. She soothed me. I swallowed hard and tried to calm down. If it was just a nightmare, then why can I still smell Macy's nose burning perfume in the air? Adira smelled it too and she frowned. What the hell? She whispered. I don't know. I sat up and looked around. I didn't sense anyone here and it seemed as though Adira and I were alone. Why did it feel like she was here though? I'm just as confused as you are. I'm going to kill her. Adira growled and sprung out of bed but I pulled her back down. Let me go, Gabriel. Adira, you can't kill her. She looked at me like I had grown an extra two heads and growled. What I mean to say is you can't kill her yet. Something is going on and we need to find out what first. When your friend gets here, let her have a look around and help us figure this out. After a few tense moments she finally agreed. Her nose scrunched up and she pinched it closed. Go shower. I hate that I smell her on you. I'm going to find something to get her smell out of here. I have sage in the pantry. Burn it with the windows open. That should work perfectly. I kissed her forehead and went straight to the bathroom. I knew something was seriously wrong when I looked in the mirror and saw that I had small scratches in my chest, where I remember in my nightmare that is where Macy had her nails. I checked all over me and saw no other marks. I didn't even see anything near my groin to suggest that it really happened, but I just felt so dirty. I swallowed the bitter taste in my mouth and jumped in the shower. No matter how hard I scrubbed, no matter how hot the water was, I never felt clean enough. Adira came to check on me and worried when she saw my skin was red and raw from scrubbing. She stripped out of her clothes and joined me in the shower, taking the loofah from me, and wrapped her arms around my neck. I buried my face in her neck and just held on to her. I don't know why it felt like I cheated but I couldn't stop this growing pit in my stomach. Adira. I whispered. She hummed and pulled back and looked at me. Without saying anything I grabbed her hands and placed them on my chest. Her eyes went there and she looked up at me confused. I closed my eyes, waiting for her to say something but I only felt her lips gently kissing my skin where I had seen the marks. I looked down and was in shock. They're gone. I whispered. What do you mean? Adira asked. I tried to explain to her what my nightmare was and the marks I saw on my chest that were now gone. Neither of us could figure it out, but we both promised we would try to stay calm and wait until we talked to Eusenia. We climbed out of the shower together and got ready for our day. As soon as we stepped outside, Adira took us in a direction opposite of where we were supposed to go. 
She was walking so fast that I had to lightly jog to keep up. How was she faster than me and I was taller? I realized which direction she was going, because with each step Macy's scent got stronger. Soon I saw her red hair in the distance. Shit. I groaned and tried to steer Adira another direction, but she wasn't having it. Adira dash, I tried to talk to her. Don't. She cut me off quickly. I didn't know what to do. I've never been in this kind of situation. I saw Roman a few yards away and signaled over to him. He saw what was about to unfold and rushed over immediately. Adira, let's go somewhere and talk. He tried to grab her wrist, but I was surprised when she twisted his arm behind his back and held him. Roman was much bigger, but I could see that right now she had the upper hand. Damn it, Adira. He groaned. Don't forget, brother. I can kick your ass when I really try. Stay out of my way. She let him go and shoved him forward slightly. The few people that were out and walking around were shocked but said nothing. I tried again to hold her but she dodged me. I could only do one more thing and I hoped it would work. I reached for her bicep and turned her towards me, quickly pulling her face to mine and kissing her. Thankfully I surprised her, but soon her lips were moving with mine. This kiss was so different than what we have shared lately. Usually it's all passion and sweetness. This was desperate, hot, and primal. Like we were branding each other in front of everyone to see. Adira wasn't holding back and neither was I. I know what she truly wanted was to show Macy that I belonged to her and only her. That was fine with me. When we finally pulled away, Roman was looking at the ground uncomfortably while Amelia laughed at his expression. We were both breathing hard, our bodies pressed against one another and our hands wrapped each other. Finally we were both calm, and I was able to steer her in another direction. I was just going to talk to her. Adira finally broke the silence when we were behind the office door. Roman and Amelia joined us. We both know how that would have turned out. I chuckled lightly. When is Yasinia arriving? Adira sat in the office chair, rested her elbows on the desk and started to rub her temples. Right now. A woman's voice came from behind me and I jumped back. She was a beautiful older woman with long red wavy hair and kind brown eyes. She looked at Adira with love and happiness. I hear you found your mate. I raised my hand nervously. Even though she looked like a nice person, I could also sense her power and absolutely did not want to piss her off. I was surprised when she squealed and hugged me immediately, but just as soon as her hands were on me they were immediately gone. Oh boy. Someone is obsessed with you. What do you mean? I asked. She put her bag down that she had hanging from her shoulder and sighed. You have a hex on you. A strong one too. Any interesting dreams lately? She raised her brow and I looked away, ashamed and I heard a dire growl behind me. It's good you didn't keep it a secret. This hex is meant to put a strain between you two. Stay honest. And stay strong. The more animosity that stems from you two, the stronger the spell gets. It feeds of negative energy. It'll take me some time to get rid of it and I am going to need the blood of the person who hexed you. Oh, you can have every drop once I'm through with her. Adira growled. Hold on. Yasenia held her hand out to stop Adira from trying to walk out of the door. The person who is obsessed may not be the person who did the hex. Witches are now selling their services. You have to find out exactly who performed the spell and where the hexed object is. Ugh. Adira slammed her head on the desk. I so do not need this added to the long list of things that have gone to shit. Yasenia walked over and started to rub the back of Adira's head in a motherly manner. We'll figure it all out, sweetheart. You know me. I won't let anyone fuck with my family. 
Adira picked up her head and looked up at Yasenia and smiled genuinely. I was happy to see her relax a little, and happy that she had a strong witch in the family to help. Adira and I showed Yasenia around. We showed her where we found the body near the cells and inside the cells where the prisoners were held. Then we took her to the morgue and showed her the body. We had to hold off the funeral when we saw her death was suspicious. Hopefully we can bury her tonight or tomorrow night. I know her kids need the closure, but they are also demanding answers. Finally our last stop was the cabin. Yasenia giggled when she first stepped in. Well I can tell you both have a very healthy sex life. I swallowed hard and Adira blushed. The office was vibing really good as well you dirty birdies. Yasenia. Adira groaned. Okay, okay. She laughed. Back to work. Yasenia walked every inch of the house but still could not find the hexed object. She did feel that magic was here, just couldn't pinpoint exactly where. I could tell it concerned her and kind of pissed her off. The more time passed and she kept coming up empty-handed, the faster her patience melted away. Yasenia's footsteps grew heavy as she stomped around the house for possibly the dozenth time. Adira and I stayed out of her way as much as possible, but we were anxious to find answers. How the hell is she doing it? Yasenia yelled when she stomped back into the living room where we waited. Every witch. No, every person that dabbles in magic leaves a trace behind. Sometimes they can cover it, but not this well. Yasenia walked over to the cabinet where I kept my alcohol and poured her a double shot of whiskey. After she downed it, she looked over at us. There is no trace here. Not one. I know you said you burn sage and yes, that helps with smell and energy, but still there should be something here. Whoever did this spell has to know you have a witch in your back pocket. Frankie did say that my brother was the king. Everyone in the supernatural community knows that my brother has a blessed mate and the great witch on his side. Adira thought out loud. Shit. Yasenia and I spoke at the same time. She poured us all a few shots, and we downed them quickly and tried to think of our next move. I can put a protection spell on you both and your home. It will keep people out of your home and away from you that have bad energies. The only thing is that the hex was put in place first, so I can't keep it out of your mind. You're going to keep having those nightmares, and it's up to you both to try and stay strong through them. Since you said that you were going to approach her today, chances are she knows that you know. That is going to make her want to up her game and probably even try to invade your mind as well. Yasenia grabbed Adira's hand and held it firm. I'm warning you Adira. You can't kill her. It will not stop the spell. If she is the one doing it then I need fresh blood. You also can't piss her off by threatening her or locking her up. The mind is a fragile thing and she can really scramble your shit. So no matter what she does in the nightmares. Stay away from her. Adira and I weren't happy at all with this new drama, but we didn't have a choice but to deal with it. After Yasenia left, my mate and I went to bed in each other's arms. Nervous to fall asleep. Nervous to dream. Past enemies. Adira's POV. The spell put on Gabriel is draining the life from his heart. Yasenia says it is slow for now, but it is unsteady. Putting a strong spell on something as fragile and unpredictable as the heart was stupid. Yasenia doesn't believe that Macy truly intended on harming Gabriel, not if she is obsessed with him, but I don't care. The bitch is putting his life at stake and it was taking more self-control than I thought I had to not got out and rip her head off. Bedelia has been clawing at the corners of my mind to come out and raise hell. But I just couldn't risk Macy doing something stupid and then my mate dies. Fuck. I can't lose him. I just can't. I look over to see Gabriel silently dying in his anger. I could see those flames in his eyes start to burn and grow wild. His breathing was picking up and I could tell he was about to explode. 
I quickly stood up and stalked over to stand in front of him. I grabbed his face and forced him to look at me, but it was like he wasn't seeing me. Like all he could see was the death and blood he was about to be knee deep in. I had to help him, had to keep him calm even though I was struggling with that aspect myself. I remember when I first saw you. I said the first thing that popped into my head. It was like lightning had struck my heart and zapped me alive. Like every moment before having you in my life was empty and cold. I knew I was missing something but didn't know it was you until my eyes met yours and my world clicked into place. I saw his eyes soften and the flames dim. I knew I had a family with my brother, but I didn't feel home until I was in your arms. I never knew I was cold until I felt your touch and it warmed me. I didn't know I was missing out on so much until I heard you say my name for the first time. His eyes were back to Hazel and he was staring at me with all the love in the world. The way he looked at me 90% of the time. You're my whole world, Gabriel. I can't lose you. The tears filled me eyes and I felt them slowly fall down my cheeks. I can't live a life without you. I won't. Gabriel wiped my tears away and cradled my face. He then leaned down slowly and softly kissed me like he was kissing me for the first time. When he pulled away, he smiled sadly and promised. You'll never live a life without me. We just got started, baby. You think I'm going to let this love story end so soon and on a bad note? He chuckled. No. You and me are going to get through this and then we are definitely taking a vacation and we aren't coming back until I got a baby, inside you. We both laughed and everyone else did too. There wasn't a dry eye in the office, including my brother. There was nothing we could do right now. We had nothing to go on and didn't know how to approach Macy without setting her off. Yesenia thought that sending Gabriel would be a good idea but I shot that down immediately. That psychotic skank was sending us sex nightmares about him and her. She was never going to get close enough to see the white of his eyes. We can't just sit on our hands and not do anything. Roman rubbed his hands up and down his face. That bitch knows something. Not only is she going after my sister and fucking with her life, but she let out prisoners and killed someone. Even if it wasn't her. She knows who it was. What kind of message are we sending the rest of the pack, if we don't handle the situation? My brother was right. It wasn't just about Gabriel and me. Others were involved. The picture was bogger than what I was seeing. I sighed and slumped in the chair. Frankie. She stood up and walked over to stand in front of the desk. Bring Macy here. Everyone looked to one another worried and anxious. When Frankie walked out of the door, next I asked the unexpected. I need everyone to leave. What? Gabriel asked first. No way. I raised my chin and stood my ground. I won't do anything stupid. Yesenia can stay to hopefully keep Macy from doing anything crazy. After some reluctance, they finally started walking out. All except Gabriel. Don't worry. Yesenia talked to him. I won't let anything happen. He walked over and cradled my face staring into my eyes. Don't let her piss you off. Just please dash. He leaned his head down and rested his forehead against mine. Please don't get crazy. We both laughed and he finally left. Do you know what you want to say? Yesenia asked when we were finally alone. I shook my head and sighed. Okay. We're winging it. About another ten minutes passed slowly and painfully before Frankie walked in with a very cheerful Macy. Thank you, Frankie. You can go. Frankie looked around nervously before finally walking out of the door. Macy. I greeted her with as much tolerance as I could muster. Have a seat. Her heels clacked against the floor, like nails on a chalkboard making me flinch uncomfortably. She sat down in such a sexy way that it made me sick. Why can't she just stop and be fucking normal? 
like every move she made was to seduce someone. Obviously, it wasn't going to work on me. I'm surprised you wanted to see me. She smiled and tilted her head to the side. Want isn't the word I would use. I murmured under my breath, but I am pretty sure she heard me. Macy, I don't think you know the details of whatever it is you're doing to Gabriel. Me? Macy placed her hand over her chest and tried to play innocent. Why? I'm not doing anything. Well whoever it is you have doing it then. I tried not to sound so annoyed, but I was struggling so hard to not reach over and dig my claws in her throat and watch her choke on her own blood. Macy, what do you know about magic? About witches? Macy rolled her eyes and I ground my teeth together. Finally Yesenia stepped in, seeing that I needed a little break. Macy, what Adira is trying to say is that maybe you were not given all the details when you decided to do your little spell on Gabriel. She snapped her head to Yesenia and looked at her up and down and scoffed. Who the hell are you? Yesenia smiled, but not just any smile. It was the smile that looked all friendly and inviting, but really she was moments away from making your insides explode. So if you know a little bit about witches then I am guessing you know who I am. The name I was first born with is Katerina Santino. Macy shifted uncomfortably in her chair. I am the great witch, and I already do not like you. Honestly, as a matter of fact, I loathe you. You know the things I can do, the things I want to do. But I do believe that you are ignorant to the situation so let me fill you in. I can see Macy trying to think of something, but she was coming up blank. Whatever magic you're using, or whatever witch you are working with, is going to kill Gabriel. No, that isn't right. Macy chuckled nervously. Shh! Yesenia placed her index finger over her lips. The spell. It is bound to his heart, right? Macy nodded. She said it would make the spell strong and you couldn't destroy it. She said it was safe and I had nothing to worry about. That it was a way to just about link our hearts together. Together? I asked and Macy looked at me. Yes. She laughed. Why do you think I can make him see what I want? But because you two are linked already by the mate bond that is why you are kind of the third wheel in the dream. Yesenia and I looked at her confused. So she clarified. The spell starts off like this, but eventually our hearts will be tied to one another and that bond will be stronger than any mate bond you have with him. Was Macy really that stupid? Or was she that desperate? What was it about Gabriel that she was so crazy for him? There must be some reason she was so fixated on him or was she just lonely? Her mind must be so clouded with her obsession that she was so easily manipulated into putting his life at risk. Now hopefully, we could make her see the truth before it was too late. Sadly, we needed her help in finding the witch who is doing all of this before it is too late. The only thing I cannot understand is how demented she must be to think a witch would be stronger than the moon goddess herself. Magic will never be greater than the destiny the goddess writes. Macy. Yesenia pulled up a chair and sat next to her. I was nervous how she would react and afraid she wouldn't believe us. But we had to try so we can start planning how to get rid of another threat. The witch is lying to you. Putting a spell, no a curse, on Gabriel's heart is indeed fueling the curse because it is draining the energy from his heart. You're lying. Macy scoffed and looked away but I saw a bit of fear in her eyes. The witch said she had nothing against Gabriel. Her eyes turned to me and an evil smirk spread on her face. She, however, has every reason to hate you. I looked at her confused, but before I could ask what she meant, she vanished. Just like that. One second she was there and the next it was like she evaporated. Yesenia groaned and leaned back in her chair in annoyance. We are so fucked. 
We called everyone back into the office and they were surprised that Macy was gone. Yesenia explained that it was most likely the witch. Macy must have had some way to signal that she needed to be pulled away. Just a slight touch of an object could have alerted the witch and she was pulled away from us. I was both angry and worried. What if she goes back to the witch and confronts her about what we said? The witch could maybe make the spell stronger and drain Gabriel's life faster. What if the witch grows concerned that Macy might sell her put and kills her to keep us from finding her? When I had told everyone what Macy said about having every reason to hate me, we all tried to figure out why, but kept coming up empty. I don't remember pissing off any witches lately, actually not at all. I rambled my thoughts, trying to think of some reason she would be after me. If Macy was right and the witch were doing this to cause me pain then I must have done something to cause her pain. Only one thing stood out. One thing from when I was on my mission to kill those who took my mother from me. One of the last men I killed had his last words before I ripped his head from his body. My wife will not be too happy about my death. He warned. Then I killed him. A witch's anger. Witch POV. Working with a werewolf is so beneath me. Especially one as stupid and desperate as Macy. The one thing I asked of her was to not ever mention me or let anyone know my motives. And what does this dim-witted, shallow moron do? She tells them exactly those things. If I still didn't need her I would tear her throat out right now. Luckily she used the charm I gave her to escape in time. Another five minutes and they would probably know every single detail. I knew that witch, Katerina, would get involved. She could never keep her nose in her own business even after all her lifetimes. I took extra precautions so at least she could never find me when this is all over. I do not want to be on the receiving end of her rage. Katerina, or Yesenia as she calls herself now, is the only other being I would ever fear. You told me that the spell is safe on Gabriel. That the spell makes his heart connect to mine, but they are saying it will kill him. Macy was having a tantrum. The third one this week. I've grown tired of her childishness and high-pitched voice when things aren't going the way she wants. What the hell is going on Hilda because if you don't tell me right now I'll dash. You'll what? I turned quickly and narrowed my eyes at her. In an instant she was on her knees, gasping for air. Do not ever think you can threaten me little girl. I specialize in tricks with the mind and I guarantee you I can make that little obsession of Gabriel turn into an obsession with a rat. Her eyes widened and I gave her back her ability to breathe. Macy gasped and coughed but said nothing more. Of course they want you to question me. If they could make you think I was hurting him then you would betray me. Would you really trust Adira when I am promising you the man of your dreams? Technically I promised they would share eternity. What I didn't tell her was that it would begin in the afterlife. If my plan stays on course, despite her idiocy, then everyone Adira has ever loved will be dead. She took all I had in this world so I am going to return the favor. I could not send Macy back to the pack, which was severely unfortunate because that meant she would be around me more. Not only do I like to work and live alone. But I have been on my own for so long that I have grown accustomed to the silence and peace. Whenever Macy was around, I couldn't even hear my own thoughts. She talks too much, moves too much and just overall irritated me to no end. Like right now she should be just sitting in a chair somewhere, happy she is alive, but no she is walking around in those ridiculous stripper heels. The clacking around on my floor drives me mad. Will you sit down? I snapped when she started to just pace in boredom. No more heels allowed in my house. Take them off and throw them outside or I will paralyze you from the waist down until this is all over. Macy raised her eyebrow at me and smirked. If you paralyze me then you'll also have to deal with me not being able to go to the bathroom on my own. Then a dog should be fine. A very obedient one who sits and is quiet. 
Finally she surrendered and kicked off the heels. Outside, I said. After a huff like a child she gathered the shoes and tossed them out onto the porch. The rest of the day went along a little better. Every now and then Macy would complain, but it was still better than her pacing with those stupid shoes. I would remind her she would be barking soon if she didn't let me work in quiet and she would shut up for a while. I swear having Macy here was like babysitting a toddler who had never had an ounce of attention and craved every minute of yours. Because Macy ruined a few of the steps in my plan, I had to come up with something different. I needed someone on the inside to keep an eye on things and keep Adira confused and worried. However, I could no longer trust Macy to keep her mouth shut or to keep her believing that I wasn't screwing her over and manipulating her. But honestly it is her own fault. She should not be so trusting and stupid. A stranger comes up to you and promises to solve all of your problems and you think there isn't a price to pay for it? How dense can she be? So now the question is, who can I manipulate into helping me? Where did you hide Keaton, his father, and the rest of the prisoners? Macy shouted from the living room. Keaton. Now there is another stupid dog who has a one-track mind and I know is hungry for some revenge. Macy. Tell me about Keaton. Complete moron. I don't know how his father thinks he could ever lead an entire pack. He has always been jealous of Gabriel since they were kids. Especially when his own mother suggested Gabriel be the next alpha. His own mother would choose a boy she did not raise. Macy laughed and flipped her hair for the hundredth time today. Literally. I counted. Her record is 204 in one day. Has a bit of a temper. And loves trouble. Sounds like my kind of guy. I mumbled to myself. After Macy and I helped free the prisoners, as soon as they stepped off the pack boundaries, they were sent to an undiscovered underground cave that I spelled to keep them in. Of course they were not very happy that they went from being prisoners of their pack to prisoners of a witch. They did calm down when I fed them a buffet of meats and beer and promised them a chance at revenge against the very pack that betrayed them. Now was time to work on keeping that promise. Stay here. I spoke as I walked past Macy. Have an errand to run. When she tried to get up to follow me, she fell to her stomach, paralyzed. What the hell? Every time you think of stepping out of this house, or even attempt it, you will lose control of all of your limbs, including your arms. Her arms then slipped from under her and her head hit the floor. I chuckled, but of course she did not find it amusing. Like I said, stay here. The hidden cave was only a 10-minute walk from my front door, so I lit a torch and started on my short journey. I honestly miss the connection I had with nature, but ever since I started to dabble in dark magic. I only feel pain and cold when I try to reconnect with the earth. Like Mother Nature turned her back on me since I betrayed my promise to only do good. That is one reason I never liked Katerina. It was like the rules did not apply to her. She could torture, kill and still do no wrong. Nature loved her and awarded her with everything. A good man, children, a home. Whereas even when I was a servant of nature I was not ever so lucky. My love was taken from me and then that stress caused me my unborn child. Adira stole so much from me and I was not going to let her have it all when I couldn't. Losing everything has made me so hateful and bitter. But what else was going to happen? I just grieve and move on. No. There was no moving on for me because my husband was the only family I had in this world. We were starting a family of our own and we were happy. Who was she to take all of that away? I cleared my head when I came to the entrance to the cave. I placed my hand on the invisible cloak I had spelled and found it still in place and untouched. When I walked through it, it rippled like water and then would camouflage itself to the outside world. There was a few steps and then I ducked to enter the cave. Down here it was at least 10 degrees colder but it didn't bother me. 
I could hear distant conversations, and could hear that they were growing impatient and tired of feeling trapped. Of course I could spell them closer to the house, but that meant more company, more noise, and more angry Hilda. Keaton was the first to see me when I came into view and he silenced the others. His father walked forward, but I waved him away from me. I had a good sense of who can be manipulated and too bad for me that even though this man was an asshole, he wasn't all that stupid. I bent my index finger, gesturing Keaton to come closer. He hesitated at first, but then came with a smile. What can I do for you? Keaton asked. Plenty. I let him pass through the barrier and the others were not happy. If Keaton succeeds in my plan, you will all be out of here in just a matter of days. With no other explanation I lead Keaton out of the cave and through the cloak. He took a deep breath and stretched his arms up above his head. It feels so good to be outside. The moonlight. The fresh air. If you're going to talk more than Macy, then I am going to spell your tongue stuck to the roof of your mouths. I grumbled and lead him in the direction of my home. Thankfully he was quiet the whole way, but that changed when I told him and Macy of my plans. They both tried to tell me it would never work and we should just show up and kill them all. Use magic. Blah blah blah. One thing they did not understand still was that I was not stronger than that bitch Katerina. Showing up half-cocked and outnumbered would be a suicide mission. Honestly, if I didn't need these mutts then I would send them all to their slaughter. But I can't do any of this on my own. Shame really because I would really enjoy watching them all kill each other. Maybe I can still organize that towards the end. Especially if everything goes wrong. If I go down, I am dragging as many of them to hell with me as I can. Enough. I shouted, completely done with their bickering back and forth on who had the better plan. I don't care what either of you think because we are going to do this the right way, my way. They both closed their traps and sulked in their chairs like children. Now back to what I was saying. Keaton, I will put a spell to disguise you as a rogue wolf being hunted. Adira will take you in and help you. They do that kind of selfless crap. You will get close, but not too close to make it obvious. I just need you to fuck with all of their heads. I'll be in constant communication with you so you'll know what to do. Macy. Her head snapped to me. You'll continue with the dreams, but I need you to kick it up a notch. Get creative. She nodded and smiled as she thought to herself. As for me, I have a few more things to do. Adira will soon be dead but not until I kill everyone she has ever loved. Past Sins Adira's POV Flashback I had been hunting down the men who murdered my mother for some time now. I long ago gave up keeping track on what day of the week it was or even what month it was. The only thing I focused on or cared about was collecting the souls of the men who made me an orphan at such a young age. The men who laughed and enjoyed ripping the only family I had apart. I was down to three more and today the count would go down to two. Vincent Bernard. I remember every little move he made the dreadful night. How he extended his canines and bared them at me to keep still while his friends continued beating and torturing my mother. How he laughed in my ear as I cried and begged for them to stop. Bernard didn't lay a hand on my mother but I could tell that he really enjoyed the emotional and mental pain he caused me. It was sick and twisted. Bernard was a very busy man. A businessman that was always on the move and very well guarded, but I knew something that could get me close enough to finish the job and get out of there undiscovered. Of course, I had no problem killing whoever got in my way, but I could not risk Bernard getting away and my chance of vengeance slipping from me. Every trip he made he stopped at the most popular gentleman's club and requested a private dance from a girl he chose from an array of photos on the wall that showed of their exotic dancers. Strippers. Their strippers and changing their title to make it sound nicer would not change what they chose to do for a living. 
all power to them for being that comfortable with their bodies, but I just could never. Tonight is the night and my wolf and I grew anxiously excited for another kill under our belt and another soul represented on our arm. At 15 I already had killed over half a dozen people and did not regret it. Except for one kill. My first kill. I shook off those dreadful memories and focused back on the mission at hand. I shook my head to clear my thoughts and raised my chin and strolled into the club from a back door where the dancers would go out for a smoke. Thank goodness for the changing lights and dark corners. It was easy to stay hidden and wait for Bernard to come through the door. The Delia was very intuitive because before my target even walked in the door, I had a feeling he was near, and just like that. Moments later the door opened, and he came inside with a wide grin on his face and a sick excitement in his eyes as he looked around. The owner strolled over and embraced them like they were old friends, and as they talked, I heard a glass break behind me. God, no. The dancer behind me cried and I saw the horror in her face as she noticed Bernard. I watched as she tried to run as fast as she could behind a curtain and my instincts told me to follow her. I listened for her crying and caught her scent that led me to a private room. When I opened the door, I saw her sitting on a couch with her face in her hands as her shoulders shook uncontrollably. I was risking so much exposing myself to her, but I had a feeling she would be how I get close. Not a fan of Vincent Bernard's? I asked and her head snapped up. As soon as she saw me her face went from horror to utterly afraid, and I did my best to calm her. I won't hurt you. Believe me or not I actually think we can help each other. What are you? She whispered. What I am is not important. What I can do is. So, tell me, what did he do to you that you ran away so quickly? I listened as she told me the last two times he was here. The girl, Diamond, was his favorite. The first time he was here was a normal private dance, but the second time, the last time, he had forced her to do other things. She has been trying to just put it behind her, but she had hoped that he would never come. She was wrong. Hearing how much of a disgusting, sick, Piece of shit, he really is made my anger build and I could feel Bedelia ready to come out and sink her canines into his throat, feeling his warm blood in our mouth and run down the sides of our lips. Here's the plan. I whispered. Within a quick five minutes, Diamond and I had come up with a quick plan, and just in time because her boss came looking for her. When I heard footsteps approaching her door I quickly hid in her closet where all of her performance attires were kept. I listened as the boss told her that Vincent specifically requested her and that this time, she would not cry through it, or she would be fired. He is paying good money that could pay your bills for at least a year. So, suck it up and give the man everything he wants, or you will be out on your ass. He yelled and I heard the door slam closed. I peeked out and saw her standing there, head hung and looking completely defeated. I reassured her that I would be there before he could lay a hand on her. Anyone could see how scared and unsure she was, but surprisingly she put on a smile that hid it all away. After lightly stroking her shoulder, we walked out of her dressing room and I hid behind her along the way so no one would see my eyes and freak out and ruin everything. We went down a dark hallway and stood in front of a door with the number 3 on it. This is the door us dancers go through. The customers go down a different hall and enter through a separate door. When the music starts, is when the curtain will open. He lets his men watch me dance for the first couple of minutes, but when it is time for the lap dance, he orders them to leave. That will be your chance. Diamond took a deep breath, but she stopped and smiled sadly. Just in case something happens, my name is Trisha Marks. I came here to get away from an abusive husband and found this was the easiest way to make money. This wasn't a life I wanted, but I just couldn't walk away from the money. Money doesn't make you happy, but it gives you security. 
Why are you telling me this? I asked her, confused. I can read people fairly easily. Even though you think you are doing a good job hiding it, I know you judge me for my choices. I just want you to know that I am a person who just hasn't had the best luck. Without another word Diamond, Trisha, had walked through the door. After a few silent moments, I heard the music start and the sliding of the curtains opening. I could also hear her pounding heartbeat and how her steps were not as confident as before, but she powered through. It only took about three minutes before Bernard ordered his men to leave. I know Trisha must be scared because that was faster than her usual routine. Two sets of footprints left, and the door clicked closed. I was so tempted to go in now, but I needed to make sure they were completely alone. Trisha had to say it. Come, his voice ordered. The slow clacking of her heels across the floor made me nervous. She wasn't supposed to get close to him. I have such a surprise for you, Mr. Bernard. Her voice was much more confident than her steps had been. No trace of fear. A friend who would very much like to meet you. My cue was coming, but she was taking her sweet time about it. I don't know what happened, but before she could say the words, a menacing growl erupted in the room. I barged in and found Vincent holding Trisha by her throat, her back flush against his chest. When he saw me, he looked just the same as he did that night, disgustingly excited. Adira. He greeted me with a smile. I knew I smelled someone familiar on this whore. Let her go. I growled but he just threw his head back and laughed. I took a step forward, but he tightened his grip on her throat and she was starting to claw at his hands for air. Let her go. Bedelia growled. In an instant he dropped her, and she fell to her hands and knees coughing and gasping for air. Bernard and I looked at each other in confusion but I didn't have time to figure out what had just happened. The two guards heard me and stormed through the door, breaking it into pieces. They saw me immediately and everything started to happen so quickly. One of the guards pulled Bernard out of the room while the other charged at me. I heard Diamond scream, hovering in the corner, as the man and I fought and soon he was on his knees, his heart in my hand. Two more men came in the door, and I took them down with no issue, needing to get to Vincent before he disappeared. I went out the door I had come and ran down the hall to the exit door that Trisha told me about. I saw in the parking lot, Vincent being loaded into an SUV. They would have to pass me to get to the main road, so I started to run forward, grabbing my knife from my waistband. When the SUV turned towards me, I tossed the knife with all my strength, hitting the front driver's tire and causing the vehicle to start to spin out of control, until it finally crashed into a concrete base of a lamp post. The driver and passenger were killed but Vincent was able to get out and start running towards the woods while the last two of his men blocked my path to him. Killing you won't be hard. As you can see, I am covered in the blood of your friends. I smiled. One of them was my little brother. The one on the right growled. I could see the resemblance now between him and the man whose heart I ripped out. There is a saying that grief makes the heart heavy. I know what your brother's heart weighs, so I guess I'll just have to compare the two. I joked, but of course it was not funny to him. It only took a matter of minutes before both of them were on the ground, dead. I wiped the blood on my hands down my black jeans and started to walk in the direction Vincent ran. I caught his scent easily and started to shift as I got closer. There was nothing that I needed to say to him. He knew why he was going to die. He could beg, plead, and threaten me, but nothing was going to change my mind. They all begged for their lives, but in the end, those cried fell on deaf ears. Vincent was standing, waiting for me in a small clearing of the trees. His hands tucked in his pants casually. I guess it comes down to this, huh? 
He chuckled. I knew you would come for me. After I heard the news of my friends being slaughtered in such a bloody manner, I knew that only vengeance could make someone lethal like that. I shook out my fur and started to growl and snarl at him. Nothing to say, Adira. Not even one little thing. I growled loud and then threw my head back and howled to the moon. My way of telling my mother this was for her. Okay, then. Let's get to it. Vincent Bernard put up a good fight, but he was no match for me and all the anger I harbored. He was a bloody mess, on his knees as I stood in front of him. My wife will not be too happy about my death. I ignored him and dug my teeth in his neck, pulling and effectively ripping his head from his body. I tossed his head to the side as his body slumped and fell to the floor. I stood there for a moment and waited for the sting. The sting that came after every kill. That was the curse of vengeance as a demon wolf. I felt every kill, and each time I thought I was ready for the pain and each time I was wrong. I felt the sting course through my body, and I whimpered, limping a little and almost losing my balance. It started to die down and when it was over, I shifted and took off Vincent's bloodied coat from his body to cover myself. The familiar burn warmed my arm and I pulled up the sleeve of the coat to watch the new souls be branded on my skin. Their ghostly souls, shrieking and reaching out to be free but being held captive by vines and thorns. Only two more to go and hopefully when it's all over, I can find a way to be at peace. A new magic. Adira's POV. Everyone has been a little on edge since Macy disappeared a couple of days ago. Gabriel hardly leaves my side and when he does, he asks someone to take his place like some sort of babysitter. We fought about it last night. I know he is only concerned for my safety since we know that the witch has a grudge with me, but I can take care of myself. I fight better than anyone who thinks they can protect me. Putting a babysitter by me will only cost someone their lives, which is not what I want. No one will die for me. No one. This morning I woke up with Gabriel gone and two guards on the front porch and two by the back door. They wished me good morning and proceeded to follow me when I walked through the village. Now my irritation was at an all-new high. We went from one guard to four after our disagreement. This was extreme and completely embarrassing. The people trust me to look out for their safety. How are they going to feel now when it seems like I need someone to take care of mine? Along the way I found my brother and his mate talking with a small group. I heard them discussing a man that was found running along our borders, screaming for help, and was put in a cell with food and water. There was a slight throb behind me eyes when I wondered who the man could be, but I ignored it believing that it was a headache forming from last night and this morning's events. So, I continued on my way to the office and waved to my family as I passed them. Only about 20 minutes later, and Roman was walking in with a humorous look on his face. Don't say it. I grumbled at him before he even shut the door. Adira. He's just worried about you. If it was Amelia, I would do the same. He sat across from me and crossed his legs. Then that makes you both fools. I shrugged and leaned back in my chair, keeping eye contact. Amelia and I are a lot stronger than you give us credit for. A lot stronger than either of you. Being stronger doesn't make you invincible, little sister. What would Gabriel do if something happened to you when you were alone? When he could have done something, anything, to prevent it? So, putting another life at stake as a distraction so I have time to run away like a coward is the answer? I argued. See, you see running away from an enemy we know nothing about is cowardice. It isn't. It's smart. It's survival. You would enter a fight head-on, unprepared, because you don't want to be seen as weak. That kind of arrogance and stupidity could cost you your life and that is what he worries about. I see you and Gabriel have discussed this behind my back. I mumbled annoyingly. 
nice to know he believes me to be arrogant. I hate to admit it, but it actually hurt my feelings to know my mate thinks so little of me. No, those were my words. Gabriel describes you as stubborn and believes you like to overly project your strength. Roman pointed out which only made me even more upset. Overly projects my strength, what does that even mean? Besides, if Gabriel didn't put the security detail on you, I would have. Realizing that there was no way around the guard dogs, I gave up and decided that if it gave Gabriel a little bit of peace of mind, then I wouldn't fight it anymore. I however would make it clear to the guards that in no way they are to sacrifice their lives for mine. I won't let someone else die for my sins that I must now answer to. Period. Of course, I know Gabriel probably told them different, along the lines of keep me safe at all costs, but that isn't right. The man that was found running by the borders, what of him? I changed the subject. Roman has not yet spoken to him and suggested that is something Gabriel or I should do. Him and I are the main leadership of this pack even though my brother is higher rank. We should still be handling pack business because Roman is still just a visiting ally. I had a lot of paperwork to do, something I dreaded each morning, so I thought this the best opportunity to get a break from it. Along with my guards and my brother, we went to the cells to find any information. Luckily, the patrol found this man, because if it was me, with everything going on right now, I would have killed him and not thought twice about it. Better safe than sorry. We arrived at the man's cell and that pain behind my eyes worsened. Roman asked what was wrong, but I assured him it was nothing. I wanted to believe that it was a stress headache. A part of me knew this was something else, but I didn't want to worry about that right now. There were other pressing matters. I looked over to the man and saw that he was very dirty, barefoot, looked like he was starving and had long hair and a beard that appeared to be matted. There was something familiar in his brown eyes. Something that was off-putting and perhaps evil? My brother looked at me questioningly as I stared at the stranger behind the bars, who also had trouble keeping eye contact with me. He shifted uncomfortably under my gaze, but that only fueled my curiosity. I know I should be asking questions, finding out information, but I was too focused on trying to figure out why the longer I looked at him, the more the pain behind my eyes grew. What is your name? Roman finally took the initiative. I am Kenneth. The man whispered as he stayed huddled in the far corner. Lie. How did I know he was lying? His heartbeat was a little elevated, but that could be from fear. Why were you running? This pack is hidden from the outside world, so how did you find us? Roman kept going, but I already knew the man would lie before he even opened his mouth. I was being chased by hunters. I didn't know this pack was here until two men pulled me into its cloak. Please, I only seek refuge. His voice broke like he was on the verge of crying, but I didn't believe this act. Adira, he's lying. Roman, how do you know? Adira, I'm unsure, but Roman, I know he's lying. There is something I am sensing, but it is still unclear. You are a stranger and cannot be trusted at this moment. Our pack is going to war soon and you could be a snake in the grass. Until we can verify your story and identity, you will remain in this cell. I finally spoke and I saw his eyes turn angry, but he quickly out on his mask again. I will stay here as long as it takes. Better here than out there being hunted down. He bowed his head and when his eyes met mine once again, I could have sworn I saw a different face. Roman turned to walk out of the cells but I remained frozen where I stood. I know what I saw. I know who I saw, but how? My brother tried to pull me along with him, but when I didn't move his suspicions were raised as well. How do I tell him that there is something so very wrong, but not explain what it is? After a few moments, I finally left with Roman and returned to the office. 
The door was shut, but this nagging feeling would not go away. Roman continued to ask me what was wrong, but I could only tell him what he already knew. Something was wrong and I didn't know what. Call Yasenia. I think she could help. I asked Yasenia to go and look at the prisoner, check if she can sense any magic being used on him. I waited impatiently in the office, and soon Gabriel had joined me. It was a little awkward at first, but the tension was eased. Soon, I was in his arms waiting for Yasenia to arrive, hopefully, with some answers. When she had finally walked into the office, I could see that she was unsuccessful. Sorry. I sensed no magic. But with the right spell, dark magic can be hidden even from a powerful witch like me. She sat on the couch and started to ask questions. What is it you're feeling when around the stranger? I explained everything to her from when I first heard of his existence to when I left the cell. When Amelia was coming into some of her newer powers, it started with a pain somewhere. Then it progressed into instinct until it was fully functioning, and she could understand what was happening. You think I am blessed like Amelia? I asked. Blessed wolves were extremely rare. Blessed demon wolves were non-existent. Weren't they? As far as we know Amelia and her mother are the only ones who have been touched by the goddess. I have never seen her, never heard her voice. Why would she bless me when I have done so much wrong? Nothing was making sense to me. Yes, I had abilities and strengths that exceeded others, even my brother, but I just thought there was something wrong with me. How could the goddess have higher expectations for a sinner like me? Could she really have something bigger and better planned for me when I don't even believe in myself? I doubted it all. There was something bigger inside of me all right, but it was nothing good and nothing pure. I was a demon wolf, constantly fighting the thirst for murder and blood. The moon goddess wanted nothing to do with me. If there was a higher power for good, then maybe there was a greater power of evil. Like the humans had a god and a devil. Maybe there is an evil equal to the goddess, and that evil is what is in me. We continued our day almost like normal. Patrol was monitored closely. We made sure they were well rested and the shift changes ran smoothly. Training was going well. Change within the structure of things were finally getting somewhere. I tried as best as I could to stop thinking about the man in the cells, but this pain behind my eyes would not go away. It was there, reminding me that there was something wrong, something hidden. I decided when the sun went down, when Gabriel was asleep, I would try to ditch my guards and go find out for myself who this man was and what he had to hide. It wasn't going to be easy. Honestly, it was going to be damn near impossible, but I have to try. The day was coming to an end, but Gabriel seemed to be more anxious than usual. Like he was on a caffeine drip and he just going and going. At this rate, there was no way he was going to be going home soon and going to sleep. Now not only would I have to try and get past my guards, I have to try and go unseen by Gabriel who was walking around checking on everything. The time came when the moon was almost at its peak, and Gabriel was nowhere in sight. I took a deep breath and thought about going out the bedroom window, but knew they would hear the horrible creaking and would come inspect the noise. There was another idea, and it just had to work. There was a small window in the bathroom that Gabriel opened when he was going to be in there a while. It didn't creak as loud, but it was a little bit higher, which means I couldn't close it from the outside. And to get back in, someone would have to give me a boost, or I would have to go all ninja up the side of the house which would definitely make some noise. As long as I get in and shut it fast enough, then there should be no problem. I hope. I went into the bathroom and closed the door. Thinking of an extra detail last minute was going to buy me some extra time. I turned on the shower and thought that if they make a perimeter check, then a window open wasn't as suspicious since it would be letting the extra steam out. After looking out of the window and seeing that there was no one in sight, 
I climbed out and slid down carefully until my arms were fully extended. The ground was only another three or four feet beneath me so I let go and tried to land as quietly as possible. I succeeded and ran in the direction of the cells. Luckily not being seen. One thing I forgot to count on, guards outside the cell building. I mentally faced palmed myself like, duh. How could I get past them without them letting know Gabriel I was out here alone? I could command them, but I wasn't going to use those commands on anyone unless the situation was life or death. Taking someone's choice away was something I was growing severely uncomfortable with. Late night stroll? A voice came from a distance behind me. Busted. I turned slowly and was face to face with a very unpleasant emotion on my mate's face. Adira. He groaned and shook his head. Gabriel I dash. Smart. Going through the bathroom window and then turning on the shower for cover. The guards believed it and so did I when I was passing by. Until I waited and didn't smell your soap. You should have at least lathered up the loofah. He cracked a small smile at the corner of his lips. I want to be mad at you, should be mad at you, but I can't help but think how cute you look right now. Like a teenager getting caught sneaking out after curfew. He stepped closer to me until we were only breaths apart, my nose coming level to the middle of his chest, his scent making me weak in the knees. Damn it he was so distracting. Where are you going, Adira? He leaned down and whispered against my cheek, his lips lightly grazing me. I swallowed hard and had trouble concentrating on where I was going just a couple of minutes ago. I loved and hated the effect he had on me. The electricity between us was intoxicating. I wanted him so badly to touch me, hold me, caress me, anything to satiate this hunger for his touch but he knew what I wanted and was careful not to give it to me. Come with me, I finally whispered, looking up into his eyes. The moon shining across his face and making him look more beautiful than ever. Afterwards we can go home together. Last night when we slept it was like we were worlds apart and I hated it. So did I. He sighed sadly and finally caressed my face with his fingertips. Just that small touch made me feel so much better. Where are we going? We walked together to the cells after I explained to him that I couldn't sleep until I knew what this feeling was. If Eusenia was right, well half right, about what I am feeling then maybe being around the stranger will give this gift a little nudge to fully progress. I was unsure if it would work, but it seemed logical since the pain behind my eyes was worse when directly in front of him. As I walked closer to the cell, could hear his heartbeat and his shuffling about. The pain intensified. I groaned and applied pressure at the outer corners of my eyes, but it didn't help. Maybe this isn't a good idea. Gabriel placed his hands on my shoulders and stopped me from walking any further. I'm fine. I lied. It was getting so bad that the pain was almost blinding me. I need to do this. I could sense that Gabriel was not happy about me being in pain, but he didn't insist on leaving. He tucked me under his arm and led us forward. Finally, I was looking into the dark cell, my eyes having trouble focusing. I started to have difficulty seeing altogether. My vision was blurry. There was a throbbing in my eye sockets and tears started to stream down my face. I fell to my knees and groaned in pain. Gabriel's arms snaked underneath me, lifting me off the ground. I'm getting you out of here. Then suddenly my vision was clear and the pain started to slowly settle down until it was gone. Wait. I placed my hand on his chest and looked up at him. I'm fine. It's done. He placed me on my feet and looked at me confused. What is done? I looked in the cell and could see a dark smoke around the man and there was shiny specks flowing around his head. His back was still turned to me, but something inside was telling me I needed to see his face. 
Something was saying I needed to see his true a face. Turn around. I ordered. He twitched slightly, but still remained still. Now. I ordered once more and finally he did. Gabriel looked between us, not seeing what I see. Not understanding, but he soon will. I raised my chin high and felt an anger boiling in my blood. Hello Keaton.